Hello, and welcome to Learning by Teaching. I'm your host, Henry Nolden. In preparation for the PhD program I've got my eyes, eyes on, I thought it best to take some time to revisit the fundamentals of thought, as it were. And to that end, I decided it would be best to go over this book, Socratic Logic by Peter Kreeft. <clears throat> it's a logic text using Socratic method Platonic Questions and Aristotelian Principles. I've gotten notes for most of the first chapter, and I thought I'd share them with you. And in doing so, hopefully it will make it settle better in my mind as well. So the book begins by him making the case for Socratic logic as opposed to more modern forms of logic, symbolic logic and the like. In this book, he seeks to emulate Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, the, uh, well, the widely held to be the inventors of logic. So, first, he makes an argument for logic in and of itself. What good is logic? He has 13 points to justify, to make his case for why logic is helpful for us. Point number one. It helps us to think in an orderly way. Logic is the study of the forms or structures of thought. The way I've come to think about it, you can't avoid using logic. You can only avoid using it well. So it's hardwired into how we think, how we perceive reality, how we interpret our surroundings. And if it's a skill we're going to use all the time, we might as well learn how to use it correctly. Uh, number two, power. Specifically, logic has power, the power of proof and, the, and of, thus of persuasion. It is the science and art of argument, argument being dialectic, and dialectic being rooted in logic, being able to dispute well. It's such a great power, in fact, that Kreeft make points out that it is dangerous to life even, for, to quote, they hate the truth, end quote. <clears throat> I think it bears reminding that Socrates, the first philosopher whom he cites as an inspiration, was in fact uh, killed for the arguments that he made using the logic that he devised. Although Socrates would not say that he devised it, more that he discovered it. Uh, number three, reading. Logic will help you to read any book more clearly and effectively. Even if the book is poorly written, logic will help you under to understand why it is poorly written, what makes it bad, what makes gives it good arguments, what gives it bad arguments, uh, etc., etc. Which leads segues nicely to our fourth point: writing. Logic will help you to write more clearly and effectively because reading and writing are a package deal. If you want to write something, you need to know how to do so in a well thought orderly and logical manner. His fifth point is interesting. He says it helps us become happy. It helps us to figure out how to become happy. I'm going to open up the book to see how he expands on that. We, see, we all seek happiness all the time because no matter what else we seek, we seek it because we think it will be a means to happiness or a part of happiness, either for ourselves or for those we love. And no one seeks happiness for any other end. No one says he wants to be happy in order to be rich or wise or healthy. But we seek riches or wisdom or health in order to be happier. How can logic help us to find, attain happiness? Here's a very logical answer to that question. One, when we attain what we desire, we are happy. Two, and whatever we desire, whether heaven or a hamburger, it is more likely that we will attain it if we think more clearly. Three, and logic helps us to think more clearly. Four, therefore, logic helps us to be happy. No other things that make us happy are contradicted or threatened by logic, though many people think they are. Uh, point number six, religious faith. He says that all religions require faith. And ask the question, is logic the ally or enemy of faith? One might think this is a contradiction in terms. How can faith be logical, reasonable, rational? Well, <clears throat> he brings up the point that faith goes beyond logic, but it never goes against logic. 
It helps to clarify and define our beliefs to deduce the consequences of that belief. Logic cannot prove all that faith believes, but it can give firmer reasons for said faith. Let's see. You cannot deny the conclusion without denying a premise. You cannot admit the premises without admitting the conclusion. Let's expand on that a bit. Yeah. The point is not that logic can prove religious beliefs. Those, that would dispense with the need for faith, but that it can strengthen them and thus also the happiness that goes with them. And if it does not, if clear, honest, logical thinking leads you to disbelieve something you used to believe, like Santa Claus, then that is progress too, for, faith, for truth to trump even happiness. If we are honest and sane, we want not just any happiness, but true happiness. Uh, seven. Wisdom. Philosophy, the very word philosophy, it comes from two Greek words, philio and sophia, which combined mean the love of wisdom. Philio meaning love and sophia meaning wisdom. Logic is to philosophy as telescopes are to astronomy or microscopes are to biology or math is to physics. It is the tool that helps us to greatly to further expand our exploration of that. Uh, number eight, democracy. Jefferson said that the art of reason is of first importance for citizens of a Republican nation. Let's examine why. Let's see. Okay. As a best-selling modern logic text says, the success of democracy depends in the end on the reliability of the judgments we citizens make, and hence upon our capacity and determination to weigh arguments and evidence rationally. You cannot have a strong and thriving democracy, republic, etc., without having a citizenry that is able to think clearly and logically. Let's see, number nine, it defines logic's limits. Logic has severe limits, but logic serves as the borders and defining lines for thought and reason. It helps to bear in mind, we need to bear in mind, to never forget the human context. We have to remember that the beliefs that people hold are not always logical or rational. No matter how much we try to do so, we'll always find ourselves holding those. That's the human context. That's the... Uh, one might call it the irrationality. I'm not sure that's the correct word for it, though. <clears throat> Suffice to say that logic will, alone will not help us to persuade people. We need to reach the human component within them as well. Uh, number 10, it helps us in testing authority. We need to have good reasons for trusting or believing in authority figures. If you just appeal to authority, well, there's a reason why that's a logical fallacy. The, uh, literally, the appeal to authority. Saying that something is true because somebody smart or somebody important believes it does not actually make it true or correct. Um, number 11, it helps us to recognize contradictions. Logic helps us give good definitions to reason that something's true or false, gives us reasons why. If something contradicts itself, then logic teaches us which ideas contradict each other. If we are confused about that, we will either be too exclusive, that is, we will think beliefs logically exclude each other when they do not, or too inclusive, that is, we will believe two things that cannot both be true. He ties this into three acts of the mind. The first one being to know what one means. Only then can we know whether they really contradict each other or not. And if they do, we need to know which one is true and which one is false. And we do this by finding reasons why one idea is true and another is false. The three acts of the mind, then, are understanding and meaning, judging what is true, and reasoning. These will be expanded upon as we continue through the book. Uh, number 12. Certainty. That is to say, logic gives us certainty. Logic has outer limits, that there are things it cannot give you, but logic has no inner limits. Like math, it never breaks down. Just as 2 plus 2 are unfailingly 4, so if A is B and B is C, then A is unfailingly C. Logic is timeless and unchangeable. It is certain. It is not certain that the sun will rise tomorrow. It is only very, very probable. 
But it is certain that it either will or won't. And it is certain that if it's true that it will, then if it's false, that it won't. So logic gives us a greater degree of confidence and certainty in the world around us and our ability to understand the world around us. He says, uh, our discovery of these principles changes and progresses through history. Arist Aristotle knew more logic than Homer, and we know more than Aristotle, as Einstein knew more physics than Newton, and Newton knew more than Aristotle. Our formulations of these timeless logical principles also change. Our applications change. But the methods, the principles, do not. How he puts it here, a moment's reflection should show us that though people should not usually be rigid and flexible, principles have to be. They wouldn't work unless they were rigid. Unless the yardstick is rigid, you cannot use it to measure the non-rigid, changing things in the world, like the height of a growing child. Trying to measure our rapidly and confusingly changing world by a flexible and changing logic instead of an inflexible one is like trying to measure a squirming alligator with a squirming snake. This is one of the things I like about Kreeft. He has the best word pictures. Um... And last but not least, 13, truth. Our last reason for studying logic is the simplest and most important of all. It is that logic helps us to find truth, and truth is its own end. It is worth knowing for its own sake. So, how does this go? Logic helps us to find truth, though it is not sufficient of itself to find truth. It helps us by demanding that we define our terms so that we understand what we mean, and by demanding that we give good reasons, arguments, or proofs. Okay. Uh, we're at 12 minutes now, so I'm going to end the video here. I hope you found this of some use. It certainly helped me. Uh, thank you, and I'll see you in the next video.